Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn to Mark chapter 14? Can you believe that we're in Mark chapter 14 after starting back in January on Mark 1? Mark chapter 14, if you have your Bibles, would you stand as we read? And we'll look at the first nine verses this morning. If you fail to bring your Bible this morning, there are Bibles in the pew this morning. Uh, they replaced the pews, uh, the pew Bibles and the hymnals a couple of weeks ago. So you join right along with us. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. After two days, it was the Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikeard, and then broke the flask, poured it over his head. But there were some who were indigent among themselves. And why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work to me, for you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. So she has done what she could. She has, gone, she has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Let's pray. Father, today we're honoring the memorial of this woman that anointed the body of Jesus Christ by breaking that alabaster flask, setting in motion again the future and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. May we look at her example this morning, Father, and see how we can follow in her footsteps, and we ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Mark chapter 14. This morning we're going to be in Mark 14, the first nine verses. Thursday night we're going to look through Mark chapter 15 with Monday, Thursday communion service, and we're going to climax next Sunday Mark chapter 16, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's going to be a great day. Jesus said these words, listen to them. Where your treasure is, there will also be your heart. Now, he's not talking about this blood-pumping organ in your chest. He's not talking about the organ in your chest that has two parts, four components, pumps blood to every aspect of your body. He's speaking about the center and the primary thing of our life, the focus of our love, the affections and priorities that we have. On one particular first day of school at a preschool, the teacher told the class to put their right hand on their heart, over their heart, and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, in Awana, we do the Pledge of Allegiance, and sometimes we have kids that put the left hand over the heart and the right hand over the heart, and sometimes they put both. <laughs> but on this particular day, the teacher watched the children as they started to say, I pledge allegiance, and then she looked around the room, and she stopped at one student, and he had his right hand on his right hip. She stopped. And she said, I told you to put your hand over your heart. He said, ma'am, my hand is on my heart. He's firmly got his hand planted on his right hip. After several attempts, she told him, why do you think that your heart is on your hip? He said these words, because when my grandma comes to visit, she picks me up pats me on the hip and says, bless your little heart. And my grandma doesn't lie. But you see, our possessions and our priorities form a spiritual intersection, and the direction in which we take determines everything that follows after that. And that's what this text is all about. It's about an intersection 
You see the intersection of the disciples, and you see the intersection of the woman with the alabaster flask. And the decision in which they take and the direction in which they go makes all the difference in the world. And there's a couple of things that I want to point out this morning in this text for us to look at. The first thing is this. There is a conspiracy and there's a promise. There's a conspiracy and a promise in the first couple of verses. Notice in the text it says, after two days, the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, the chief priest, the scribes, sought how they might take him by trickery. Conspiracy, in other words. And they said, not during the feast. Not right now is what they said. Mark begins this long, detailed, uh, passion narrative for us in John, or excuse me, in Mark chapter 14, recording the time, recording the, the timber, uh, recording the, the tone and the circumstances following Jesus' final days in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to notice the time of the Jerusalem, the time of the passion in Jesus. Notice what it says. Two days after he had been sitting on the Mount of Olives with the disciples last Sunday, Jesus is in Bethany on the eve of the feast of the Passover, which extends to the feast of the unleavened bread. It's one of the most continuous celebrations that Jewish people experienced. Now, the Passover is known as the Feast of Redemption. So you have the Feast of the Redemption then going into the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which is another whole reminder of God's hand on Israel in Old Testament days. It commemorates that night in Egypt when that angel of death passed over the homes of the Israelites if they had the blood on the doorpost. If you remember reading in the book of Exodus, that's where that comes from. The Jewish people continue to sacrifice a a lamb on the eve of the 14th month of Nisan and feast on that meat the following day. That's the context of this passage. That's the time in which this is happening. And Mark purposely, I think, folks, introduces the passion narrative by noting the time of the Passover had come. Jesus Jesus had experienced other Passovers, but this was the final one. This was the one before he would go to the cross. And Jesus is to be that lamb. And his blood is to be the price of that redemption. It was to equal what God did in in Egypt. It was to equal what happens in Exodus. It was to equal what happened on that night when the Israelites passed the blood on their door and the angel passed over. You see, that's the timing of this wasn't just any particular day that Jesus went to Jerusalem and went to Bethany and then was going to go into Jerusalem. It was the Passover. I want you to notice the tone of this Passover as well. Look at the text. The tone sets it. It's the narrative. Jerusalem would have been bursting at the seams at this time. Jewish law said that every man within 15 miles had to seek and meet the requirements to meet the feast in Jerusalem. And every Jew in the world aspires to eat at least one meal of a Passover lamb in the holy city during their lifetime. They want to go at least once in their life to experience it in Jerusalem. It's kind of like we want to go somewhere just just once in a lifetime. We want to go somewhere, right? whether it's Tahiti, whether it's Jerusalem, whether it's wherever you want to go, you've got, you always got in the back of that mind, in the back of your, 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 your ideas of, I want to want to go one time. If I could go anywhere in the world one time, I want to go there. That's how the Jewish people looked at the Passover. Now, as I've told you before, Josephus, the Jewish historian during those times, gives us an indication of the numbers of the the pilgrims that populated the city of Jerusalem on this particular day. He writes about this in his book. Listen, he writes about an incident involving Nero in AD 65. The emperor's tyranny convinced him the insignificance of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was no big deal, in other words, to Nero, he says. But listen to this. An advisor of Nero felt different. An advisor of Nero proposed to count the number of lambs that were sold during the sacrifice of the Passover to illustrate the strength 
of the Jewish people, to elevate the, the strength and the, the numbers of the Jewish people because Israel was underneath the Roman power at that time. So he wanted to count all of the lambs. And by law, one lamb would serve as a minimum for 10 people. So keep that in mind. On that particular day, this advisor to Nero said that there were 265,000 lambs sacrificed and purchased in Jerusalem on the Passover. Now, if you take 265,000 times 10, that gives you roughly 2.5 million people in Jerusalem. Some of us have been there. It was crowded when we were there, but not 2.5 million. But you multiply that number by the minimum of 10, and that equals a Passover population that that goes between 2.5 and 3 million people in the city. It's later said in the book of Josephus in his writings, he says Nero changed his mind because he saw and he was astounded at the number of people and therefore Jerusalem had no more insignificance to him. It became very significant. That's the setting of this. That's the tone. What Nero did was he sent reinforcements into Jerusalem on Passover days after that. He stationed them around the city to watch, and watch for signs of rebellion. So that's the context. That's the tone. Now, Nero is a little bit removed from the actual day of which Jesus was in Mark chapter 14. But notice the circumstances as well. The, the, the masses of people in the Passover celebrated Sometimes they cause trouble. It's just like with any big, large gathering. There's always going to be a few in that group that's going to create some problems, right? And that's what happened with the chief priests and the scribes. They pledged themselves to trickery to kill Jesus. And the influx, you add to that the Galileans that came that had Jesus been ministering to in the northern region, that's going to create some friction, right? The trickery of the scribes and the Pharisees in this text remained the only alternative for them to get Jesus and to crucify him. And if they delivered Jesus to the Roman authorities for a sentence to death in this text and in the sequence of these events, that might get them in a little trouble. There might be a major rebellion. Who wants to have a rebellion of 2.5 million people or 3 million people? And besides that, that would alienate the scribes and the Pharisees from the Romans who were charged with keeping peace in the Jerusalem area, in the Palestine area. And see, all of those masses of people would be a a formidable enemy. But they became a temporary barrier for the scribes and the Pharisees because they had to hold back from their trickery. You see, when I look at this story, I'm reminded that redemption never operates in a vacuum. There's always ebb and flow. There's always come and go. This event of the Passover, though, foreshadows the sacrifice and the substitution of Jesus Christ. Life in the midst of death. Life. Love in the presence of hate. Joy in the setting of sorrow. Justice in the setting of mercy. That's what's going on in this passage. And these are all signs and counter signs and telltale signs of God's redemptive process all throughout the Old Testament. So there's some conspiracy in there, but yet there's the promise. The promise is that Jesus Christ is the Lamb. He is the sacrificial lamb. Whether he rode in on Palm Sunday like we read in in Luke or you can read it in other gospels, he rode in as the substitute, as the promise of Jesus Christ, or as the promise of God to fulfill the redemptive plan of God. That's the promise. Now, if you look at these other verses, there's a couple of things in these verses, verses 4 to 9. Look at them. They're criticism, and then there's the anointing. 
There's the criticism by the disciples and the anointing by the woman who will find out who it is in just a few moments. Now, notice the text in verse 4. There were some who were indigenous. In other words, they were upset with themselves, upset with why that oil was wasted. Jesus makes some remarkable statements in this text. First of all, he's telling the disciples, if you wanted to do good, you could do it because she's done it. He's also telling them, stop criticizing her, which is good advice, right? Obviously. But I want you to notice a few things in this text. Number one is this. Jesus never seems to amaze, never ceases to amaze us. His foreknowledge of the coming of his death and the suffering, can you imagine the weight that he must be bearing at this moment in time? It's a plot to kill him. I mean, just think if you found out somebody was trying to kill you. You're looking over your shoulder. You're wondering who it is and how they're going to do it and all this. Jesus didn't have to worry about that, but yet I still believe physically he had to carry some kind of weight of knowing how it was all going to be, even though he already knew the outcome. I mean, you think in this passage, in this text, within hours, he'll leave Bethany for the last time. Last time. He'll walk up over the Mount of Olives. He'll walk down the Kidron Valley. He'll cross over the Kidron Valley. He'll enter into that holy city, Jerusalem, through the eastern gate, more than likely, to celebrate the Passover in which he himself will be the Lamb. And how does Jesus spend those last hours of his physical life? He goes to a party. He goes to Bethany. According to Mark's gospel, it's Simon the leper. Simon the leper hosts a Passover Eve dinner at the home of Jesus as the honored guest. Look at the text. Being in Bethany, the house of Simon the leper, he sat at the table. We'll stop there for a moment. Now, nothing is known about Simon except he once had leprosy. If this fact is combined with an act of gratitude shown by the anonymous woman, then we can summarize that this dinner was probably kind of a reunion type dinner. Anybody, anybody have high school reunions still? How many of you hate to go to high school reunions? Yeah, they're, they're like, oh, do I really want to go? But you could summarize from this passage in Mark that this is somewhat like a reunion of the close friends of Jesus. He stayed in Bethany often. He would be well known to the disciples, but also he would have close friends, and he would be well known by the people who touched and changed by Jesus in any other way. Now, if Simon, perchance, was the leper who Jesus healed at the very beginning of his ministry. This is the same Simon, same area, same location. There was a a, a diplomat one time who was held hostage in South America for a number of times and in prison for months. And when he arrived home after his release, the reporters asked him this question. They said, what do you want most now that you have your freedom? You know what he said? He said, I want three simple things. I want a good meal, good mu- a good book, and talk with friends. And Jesus makes that similar choice here. He's spending his last hours in Bethany at the home of a friend who possibly and most likely was Simon the leper who began Jesus' ministry, and now he's here at the end hosting other people that Jesus had ministered to and touched. We can only imagine him spending that last day before heading to Simon's house to eat good food, to talk with good friends. And one thing is sure. There was no pessimism. There was no second guessing that hangs over Jesus' choice to move forward with God's plan. Jesus won't allow anything to change him, in other words. And what we see happening here is genuine graces of conversation 
Can you imagine sitting around the table, eating with family, friends, people that you know and love, saying goodbye, Jesus saying goodbye to them, and then all of a sudden, this woman walks in with a flask of expensive oil, cracks the neck of it, and pours it over his head. Can you imagine the shock, the quietness in that atmosphere that there would have been? See, everything was okay until until that woman acts out of love, which throws the disciples off their mindset. And by custom, she would show hospitality to honor the distinguished guest by just taking a drop and anointing his head. A single drop. It says spikenard. Spikenard was an expensive perfume. It was an expensive oil. It was imported from India. But we see in the text her gratitude to Jesus doesn't fit within the boundaries of the moment because of the cultural thing to do was just to tap Jesus on the head with drop of one dot. But breaking the neck of the alabaster flask or the jar or the container, she pours it all over Jesus. Can you imagine the disciples? What is she doing? Now, who is this woman? John, the Gospel of John records the same incident. And in the Gospel of John, John identifies her as Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And if that's so, we can understand the gratitude as well as her grief, right? If you know anything about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, Jesus had no closer friends than Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He had privacy in their home. He rested there from the pressure in which he was under sometimes. He probably confided in them things that are not recorded in Scripture. We're just, I'm just assuming that, but they would want to know about the future. Mary had already shown her unusual sensitivity to Jesus because you remember in the passage where Jesus goes to the house, Which one's up busy doing things and which one's sitting at the feet of Jesus? Martha's busy and comes to Jesus and complains. Tell her to get up and get in the kitchen and help out. And what does Jesus say? She is doing what she needs to do. Beyond all of that, the very fact of Jesus coming in John chapter 11 and raising their brother from four days in the tomb. Can you imagine how how she could crack open that flask and pour that whole bottle as gratitude for what Jesus was doing? When love and understanding and gratitude mix and merge into one, You can't contain yourself. That's what I see happening with Mary in this text. She can't contain herself. She breaks open that flask and pouring that oil and creates a crisis of spontaneous love which provokes criticism from the disciples. It's in the text in verse 9. Jesus matches her devotion with the everlasting memorial that still preached taught and read today like we did, that whenever the gospel is preached, this story will be told. That's who this woman was. It was Mary. Now, let's look at her spontaneous love for a moment. Look at the text. She cracked it open. She poured it on his head, and some were criticizing. Most of our love, if you really want to be honest, most of our love is channeled through routine, daily, standard patterns in which we express ourselves, right? And that should be that way. But on rare and spontaneous and grand occasions, spontaneous love breaks out of those channels and just does something totally different. That's why it's called spontaneous. It's kind of like a child, for instance, catches a mother by surprise with a clean room. (laughs) Any mothers ever surprised by a clean room? 
All the toys picked up. All the Legos picked up. No more stepping on Legos with your bare feet. Or maybe it's a handful of wilted dandelions. A mother's typical response is, what did you do? And it's really just a spontaneous gratitude of love. Mary didn't have to break that flask open and pour that perfume over Jesus. Her spontaneous act surprises everybody in the room as she expressed her opinions. You see, people whom Christ redeemed, like me and you, that are believers in Jesus Christ, redeem us from our sins. We ought to be the most extravagant believers we can be when giving gratitude, when giving love, when giving grace. There are those times when spontaneous and extravagant love is appropriate. There are some of those. But then we get to the rest of the text, and the disciples were criticizing her. Look at the text. It's almost like a, 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 you throw a wet blanket over the party, and it kind of simmers down. The disciples, led by Judas, launch a barrage of criticism against her. First, they say what? The oil's wasted. That tells me they didn't really understand exactly what she was doing. Second, they say that oil could have been sold and the proceeds given to the poor, which was, yeah, it was probably a pretty good idea to do that. But you see, criticism is only valid if spiritual truth is limited to ritualistic traditional ideas. She's going outside the box. Logically, the disciples' reasoning that that opportunity to, could have anointed many people. She could have took that little flask of oil and, and anointed many people, but yet she put it all on Jesus. And they began to attack her. Now, if you stop and analyze this whole passage, they attacked her on stewardship. They attacked her on faithfulness. They attacked her on, on compassion. They attacked her on, on the anointing of Jesus. And you see, that's why criticism is always dangerous and is very delicate. Criticism is kind of like a, a surgeon's scalpel. It can cut to bring healing or it can cut to kill. And we'd be very careful about how we criticize people. And Mark notes in the text that the disciples start their attacks with principles. If you notice that, principles. It was wasted. Could have been used, sold. And then they move from principles to the person. Look at verse 5. What does it say? And they criticized her sharply. Sharply. Judas, the leader of the critics, his arrogance and his greed proved to be fatal. You continue to read in Mark chapter 14 this week, you'll find out. But notice Jesus' response in verse 9. His response is, he calls the act beautiful, not wasteful. In Mark chapter 6, he says, good work. Verse 6, he says, good work, meaning it's, it conveys a, a, a sense of beauty that gives goodness. And it, it, the Greek word there, kalos, means that it's attracting and, and attaching beauty and artistic glow. That's the meaning of that word. It's, it's, it, what Jesus is saying is it goes beyond this moment. There's always a debate over the waste of beauty that never really goes anywhere. Like there are some who think fine arts of work grand paintings, visiting an art gallery, listening to a symphony, seeing a play, reading a great literature. They say that's, that's all good works. And then there's other people that debate it and say, eh, I'd rather see a sunset. But Jesus in this passage puts himself in a place to say, See the big picture of what she's doing, guys. See the grand beauty of she's anointing me before I'm even crucified. Because when you're hanging on the cross and Roman thought is this, 
if you're a criminal, you don't get anointed. You don't get embalming it when they take your body down. They throw you in a tomb. Mary was doing something the disciples didn't even understand yet. And that's why on Easter Sunday, they went with all those spices again to anoint the body. Jesus goes on in this passage to counter out the criticism of the disciples because of their insensitivity to the poor. They they said, well, she don't care about the poor. We could have sold that. (laughs) Jesus says, you could always do good. But right now, I'm here and I'm not going to be here a few days from now. So Jesus counters the disciples' criticism by putting the, the meaning in the condemnation of she has done what she could. Jesus said that a lot, but a lot in different ways. You remember when the widow came by the treasury and dropped in her two mites? Pharisees got upset. He's saying the same thing. She did what she could. Jesus says that a lot of times in scriptures. They did what they could. How many times do we see Jesus talking about the total giving of oneself to love your neighbor in the sum of all of the commandments? Many times in scripture. Indirectly, Jesus is really chastising the disciples. He's saying this, you've not given your all, so what can you do? And then Jesus turns to match the woman's gratitude with his own. In response to her love, Jesus makes this lasting, eternal tribute that extends around the world wherever the gospel is preached. And still, 21 centuries later, we're still talking about this woman, what she did, and why she did it. Here's the thing. We have to do what we can with what we have. And how do we do that? Very simply, a couple things. We have to take inventory of your abilities. I have to take inventory of mine. You have to take inventory of your ability. This woman had a bottle of perfume to serve Jesus with. God gives each and every one of us, folks, different abilities to serve him. Maybe we need to break open those abilities and let God use us. In the parable of the ten talents, the landowner gave each servant different numbers of talents, and you know what he said? It was according to their ability. Take an inventory. What are you good at? What's your abilities? What's your talents that you can break open and let God use? Next thing is take inventory of your situation. The woman knew where Jesus was, and she had an opportunity to approach him. What do you, what do I have an opportunity to do? Galatians says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. What opportunities do you have today to serve? What opportunities do you have this week, this month, the rest of 2022? And the third thing, how we evaluate is we act. We can evaluate all we want, but unless we act upon what we've evaluated and say, I need to make those changes, it's all for naught. The woman didn't have the bottle of perfume and opportunity to approach Jesus, and then she acted upon it. She did have those. If you want to do what you can, then you must do it. Act. And then finally, This woman gave something that was costly to Jesus. What is the costliest thing that you've ever made to Jesus? I hope it's your heart. I hope it's your your life to follow him. Mary didn't care about the social taboos of one drop. Mary didn't care about the personal embarrassment when she worshiped Jesus? What is the costliest offering you have ever made to Jesus? I hope it's your life to trust him, to follow him, to walk with him, to experience the salvation that he's getting ready to take and purchase for us in the scriptures. 
And the second question is this, how can we follow her example? How can we follow Mary's example? It's pretty simple. Giving ourselves to Jesus for salvation that he guaranteed with his life and death and resurrection. Giving ourselves to Jesus in living and growing in the faith that we believe as we follow him. By giving an act of spontaneous love to others for Jesus. Giving him your heart and your passion to love him, to follow him, to serve him. You see, the disciples and Mary were an intersection in this passage. And we find ourselves at an intersection in our lives. Do we follow the path that takes us closer to God? Do we follow the path that takes us further away? It's an intersection. And the choice you make determines the direction you're going to go, determines your destination. So when I look at this passage, I'm reminded of a couple of things. Number one, be careful about criticism. And number two, do all you can for Jesus out of spontaneous love because he rewards that. Let's pray. Father, this morning, in just a moment, we'll sing an invitational hymn. And there's an intersection in that invitational hymn for those whom you have called to come forward and to be faithfully in serving you, to accept that gift of salvation, to accept the free gift that that you're headed into in Mark chapter 14, to purchase the redemption of mankind, to purchase our salvation, to purchase our eternal security. During this invitational hymn, There's an intersection for those that do not know you. They need to make the right choice. Do I continue to live the way I am, lost in my sin, or do I take this new path called the gospel way that leads to security and eternal life with you? Father, help us choose the right path. For others, Father, maybe things on their heart and in their lives that are Difficult for them to to hold up under the weight of. Come. May they come and unload those upon you. Whatever the need is, you are the answer. You are the direction. You are the path. You are the choice. And may we respond out of spontaneous love for who you are as you speak to us during our invitational hymn this morning. Because it was all at the cross where the difference was made. And the cross is the intersection of life that changes life, changes destinies, changes purpose, and changes direction. So, Father, you speak to our hearts as you always do. And may you, Father, draw us close to you. And we ask this in your name. Amen.